Okay, we want to continue with our examination of this. And I want to, I don't want to confuse you, but it's too late. So let me go back just a moment and, and sort of synthesize where this is going. When you follow rules of interpretation, you're constantly observing what the rule requires of the text. And as you study scripture, and as you become time conscious, most Christians are not time conscious at all. They just read the Bible and they have no concept of the event and the circumstances and the timing and the body of knowledge that is known at that time as they try to examine what the scripture says. When Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7, that the end of all things is near, I've heard preachers get up and use that as a theme text. Peter had nothing in mind about the year 2000 when he wrote that. Peter knew nothing about what we know about today when he said that. Peter, looking around and in his day and in his environment, he made that statement. And he said, the end of all things is near, based on all that he knew. But did he know about the year 2000? Not, a, not at all. So when you quote Peter, be sure you let Peter speak for himself. That's, it has to be that way when you study the Bible. Now, what I'm trying to show is that in Daniel 7, we're just going right down the timeline and we finish the vision when we get to the fire. The beasts are burned in the fire. That's the end of the story. Now what follows is commentary. Some explanation. The vision has essentially been given and now Daniel is going to go back and he's going to provide some most important details. For example, he's going to tell us how long the little horn wages war against the saints. How long? 1,260 years. I'm going to present the Jubilee calendar this coming Sabbath. This is a topic of profound importance as it relates to timing in chronology of, this, of prophecy and how the Sabbath so beautifully fits into this picture. So we're going to find that after verse 11, actually 12, if you want to count the comment made in verse 12. From 13, verse 13 to the end of the chapter, Daniel is going to give us commentary. The vision has been established. All the way from the lion, all the way down to the fire. Everyone with me so far? You understand at least what I'm trying to say? You don't have to agree, I just want you to understand the concept. Now, Daniel tells us that Jesus, one like the Son of Man, comes before the Ancient of Days and is led into his presence. That tells you that Jesus wasn't in his presence. Yes or no? How can you be led into his presence if you were already in his presence. Jesus is not sitting on one of these thrones, is my point. Jesus is elsewhere. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. The clouds of heaven. A lot of people take this verse to mean Christ's coming, second coming, clouds of heaven. The clouds that are being spoken of here is a retinue of angels that are carrying Jesus. He's coming with a clouds. In fact, in the Old Testament, often the language is used swarms or clouds to denote large bodies of armies or people. He's coming with a large retinue of angels. 
And where is he going? Not to earth. This event is happening in heaven. All these thrones have been set up. All these angels have been gathered around. This is no ordinary service. This is a once in a eternity event. And Jesus, the Bible says here, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led or accepted, allowed into his presence. And verse 14 tells us he was given something he didn't have. Authority, glory, and sovereign power. Sovereign power means having all power. To be sovereign means there is no higher authority. This means he's given all there is. A sovereign state is a state under the dominion of no other state. A sovereign king is a king having complete control of his kingdom. And Jesus is given this. Well, when did this happen? That is the multi-million dollar question. So you want to be a millionaire, do you? Watch what, the, watch what the Bible tells us here. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of these standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this, and so he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. This is what one of those attending said to Daniel. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Let me explain that very quickly. Here Daniel sees the earth. He sees the kingdoms changing one time it's owned and operated by the Babylonians. Next time, it's owned and operated by the Medes and the Persians. Next time, it's owned and operated by the Grecians. Next time, it's owned and operated by the Romans. And the angel talking to Daniel says, Daniel, understand, one day it'll belong to God's children. It just has to go through this cycle of things until that time shall come. But the saints of the Most High. What, is, what did Jesus say? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Daniel's curiosity got him. I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying in its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing or stronger, more powerful than the others and that had the eyes of a, of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now watch very closely. Uh, uh, an important key is about to unfold. As I watched this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came, came. Where did he come from? Thrones were put in place in this convention and the father came and took his seat. The father came from some other place and he came and he took his place on his throne and then the court 
was seated. Notice what happens. We're going to see the heaven-earth linkage law. This horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. I haven't read it yet, but perhaps you already are aware of it. Look down at verse 25. What does the Bible say about the length of time that the horn power is going to persecute the saints? Time, times, and half a time. Now, watch this logic and see if this works for you. When we see the little horn power brought down, Something has happened in heaven to make that occur. Watch this again. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. Here's the way I interpret it. The period of time that's called time, times, and half a time, we have in Scripture no indication as to when that date actually began. In other words, a person living right here on the timeline, say in 400 A.D., could not tell you when the commencement of this time period would, would begin. Because the scripture just says, he's going to wear out the saints for this much time. But we don't know where that much time belongs. We don't know where it starts. In fact, the people living right here in 1000 A.D., they don't know where this thing starts and stops. There is no, I repeat, there is no historical writing by any Christian in this era stating that the horn, little horn power is going to be brought down in 1798, 700, 800 years from now. There, in, the, in, in fact, we don't get any writing by any students of Bible prophecy pointing out when the horn power is going to come down until we get right there at the doorstep. And a guy by the name of Cotton Mather, president of Harvard, goes on record as one of the first in the United States indicating that he thinks the papacy will come to its knees, be brought down from its lofty perch somewhere around the year 1800. Did very well. But he's only about 100 years off, you know, I mean 100 years back from the actual event. What I'm trying to say, God gave a period of time that is defined, but there's no starting and stopping places. The key is that we watch for the little horn power to come down so that we, we can then back into its beginning. Right? I mean, it's the only way you're going to get there. But more importantly, when we see the little horn coming down, we know what's going on in heaven. Watch again the verse. I watched as this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. What's the word until suggest? until the Ancient of Days does something about it. See, when this prophecy was given to Daniel, its purpose is to link this big event with this larger event. The Ancient of Days, the first order of business, when the Father takes his seat, is to say, Little horn, be gone. 
be brought down. Your power, your time has come. God sets him up. He takes him down. He pronounced judgment, a restraining order, if you will, against the little horn power and put the little horn power in submission to Napoleon. Napoleon is the general, is the uh, conqueror. Berthier and generals Berthier and Waller in February of 1798 took the Pope in exile. And I know, at least in my mind, that this came down, the little horn was brought down because the Ancient of Days had issued the command. I know that the Babylonian Empire fell because the Ancient of Days issued the command. And the handwriting was put on the wall and Daniel was brought in to read it. Remember? It's the same parallel, same pattern. This comes down because the Almighty has declared it to be such. So, defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor. He pronounced a restraining order on the little horn power. And persecution stops. Now, earlier, up here in the vision, notice that after the court was seated and the books were open, Daniel's view is directed back to watch the horn power because of the boastful words the horn was speaking after the Ancient of Days took his seat. What this means is that after 1798, this is where Let's say the deadly wound is inflicted on the, oops, inflicted on the Christian church, Catholic church. After this is, occurs, Daniel, before we get to the fire, he sees the horn power speaking boastfully again. See, here is 1798, and I say it's 1798 because that's when the horn went down. I know what's, it's the heaven-earth linkage here. And so he continues to watch after 1798 because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. So even though it's brought down, this implies a healing. And if you are following where I'm going, you know in Revelation 13, we find a very interesting d d drama. Let me jump to that for just a second and um, show you something that a lot of Christians have overlooked. Revelation 13, verse 2. There's a, there's a beast that comes up out of the sea, and he looks like a leopard, has the feet of a bear, and the mouth like a lion. Well, where do you find those animals? Here in Daniel 7, we just looked at him. And um, notice what this, uh, the, the dragon, the devil, is the hand inside the puppet. The Bible says here, the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. So we're talking a puppet. And uh, watch this. One of the heads of the beast seemed to what? have had a fatal wound, but what? The fatal wound had been what? Healed. When was the fatal wound inflicted? <coughs> when? So when, when must this happen? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. After 1798, we see the healing. This beast, in fact, this beast has not yet appeared. This first beast has not yet appeared because the fatal wound has not yet been healed. When he comes up, the Bible says, in the past perfect tense, had been healed. And when he comes up, when this beast appears, and I'm going to try to present that tomorrow night, you're going to see that the Christian Roman Catholic Church and Christians uh, all involved 
are going to play a very profound role in this process. Daniel is telling us that the healing is coming. Revelation clearly confirms it. Okay? One more thing here in Daniel 7 before um, I, I run to Revelation. I want to show you one more thing. Uh, just down here in verse 25. Little Horn Power would be notorious for setting itself up in opposition to the Most High. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. Okay? The Catholic Church, uniquely and without question, historically, meets all the specifications found in Daniel chapter 7. Nobody else meets, can meet the specs. Little Horn Power has to pluck up three of the original ten. Little Horn Power has to come out of Rome, the fourth kingdom. Little Horn Power has to wage war against the saints. But there's this next sentence I want you to see. I find that most Christians today have never read this sentence. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. Many of my friends who believe in the rapture, one of the arguments they always use is that I just can't believe that God is going to hammer on the saints during the tribulation by requiring them to be here. In other words, he's going to rapture the saints out of earth and then he's going to hammer on the wicked and he's going to beat them into submission and then when he comes, he'll take those that submitted. What a God. But I say to my friends, have you not read Daniel 7.25? The Lord handed over the saints to the little horn for 1,260 years and you're saying he won't do that? Something's wrong. What was God thinking when he handed his children over to the authorities for persecution? What did God, why did God do that? Why did he allow that? What was his purpose for that? Any ideas? <laughs> the only way to keep truth alive and the importance of it in a, in, in a fallen world is through persecution. Prosperity ruins truth like nothing else. Because when we have prosperity, our need to live by faith is almost shut out. But when we can't make it, our need of faith grows. And God knows in His infinite wisdom that living by faith is what is so important in our growing up experience. Prosperity, it's like this program on television about becoming the millionaire. It has become the number one viewed television program, not only because it's interesting and fun, but because it speaks to every heart. We all want, to, well, maybe not yours, Kevin. We all want to be rich. We all want all the toys. We want everything. We, and Jesus kept reminding us, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. So why are you pursuing this? Why are you salivating for this? What's wrong with this picture? You see, 
What God is trying to do is to teach his children to live by faith. And this is why the saints were handed over to the little horn, because faith, the fuel that keeps faith burning, is truth. There have been a few, yes. There have been a few, and I'm sure will be a few, like Nicodemus, you know, and others who use their wealth according to God's direction. And so let me, I've said enough about this chapter in Daniel 7 to set you up now for Revelation 4 and 5 and 6. Really? Remember, we're studying the seven seals. Did you forget? <laughs> That's why I keep some broke trying to fill up my faith bucket. <laughs> okay, Revelation 5 1. I'm going to take, well, actually, I want to take you to Revelation 4 2 first. And, um, and I want to ask you to consider something for a minute. Watch this up here for a minute. This is Daniel 7, and here is 1798. We've talked about that, and we've talked about that. I'm going to try to impress you with the facts that Daniel and John were shown the same thing. Daniel is back here at 600 B.C. John is down here at 95 A.D. And so what we see in Daniel 7 and what we see in Revelation 4, I'm going to try to show you, I believe, to be the same thing. And what this really means, what this means, is that the opening of the seals began in 1798. That's where I'm going. Try to give you a little head start so you can see that I don't totally confuse you. Okay. John is called up into heaven. And um, I think it's sort of like what the experience Paul had. I was in the spirit, and when he's in the spirit, it's like he's really there. Paul says, I couldn't tell if I was there or not there. But it was so real, I was there. <laughs> so when God puts a person in vision, physically, they don't have to leave earth. He can just put a whole new reality, right in your head and show you things that you need to know. Yes, yes. And uh, in Revelation 4.4, 4, he saw the throne, and around it were 24 other thrones, and on them were seated the 24 elders. So Daniel made it clear that we had plurality. Thrones were set in place, and that thrones being plural indicates that that we have an august group of people or an august assembly of very important people. Thrones indicate a certain posture, certain authority. And I'm saying that there's the Father's throne and here are the 24 around, around His, 24 thrones. Okay, and uh, you know about the, the elders, there are 24 because there are 12 tribes. <coughs> Two witnesses from each tribe. What God is about to do, He wants in this inner circle, He wants human beings to be present to see what is going to take place. So that after the second coming, all the saints will be able to ask these human beings what went on and how did it happen. There are 24 witnesses from each tribe of the 12 tribes. And um, so the 24 elders. And let me jump down to, uh, I'm, there's a lot that could be said. I could spend a, a week on this, but I don't have the time. So verse 1 of chapter 5, John says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So here we're now going to Daniel says nothing about this little book. John 
tells us only and uniquely about it. And the funny thing is about Revelation 5, 4, 5, and 6, now listen to this. The funny thing is there is no direct way to place Revelation 4 and 5 on a timeline. The best we can do, if you just look within Revelation 5 and look at nothing else in the Bible, the best you can do is that all you can say, it has to be after the cross because the lamb looks as though he had been slain. So all we can say is sometime after that, looking just at the internal evidence of that chapter. So he saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne the scroll. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Now, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one, now watch this, this is neat. No one in heaven or on earth or even among the dead under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Verse 3 tells me that a careful consideration of all of God's creation is involved. I don't think this is just a sham that's put on to entertain the angels. I think that, a, that an investigation was done of all the angels, all the human beings, both living and dead. I believe anybody who has ever had life was considered for this pro, for, as a possibility. And no one is found worthy. It's like hiring the, the, the vice president of a large corporation to be the chief financial officer or choosing a CEO. You want someone who is worthy to bear such enormous responsibility. And no one is worthy to, for the job. No one can measure up for the job. And, and the father intentionally puts on this demonstration of examining and offering this job to anybody before Jesus is considered. Because this book is going to exonerate his government. This book is going to exonerate the charges that Lucifer originally brought when the contents are finally exposed. If the contents are exposed prematurely, guess what the results are? It shows what God foreknew, and he'll never be able to escape the claim that he used his foreknowledge to make it all turn out this way. So this book can only be opened after the thousand years are over when the drama is completely finished. And so somebody's got to be worthy to go through this process having this authority and this power to do that. Does that make sense? Joey? Okay. Look at verse 4. I wept and wept. Why do we cry? Why, do, why, why was John crying? Hopeless. He saw two things I, that I believe, that, or even though it's not said here, this is the way I understand it, that when he saw that no one could exonerate God, it upset him. No one was worthy. No one was capable of setting the Father and his government free of any shame. If somebody has ever told a lie about you and it is believed by a large number of people, you can never, never escape it. True or false? Lucifer lied. A third of heaven believed and more since, not counting what's on earth. John was distressed. No one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He 
is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns. And what would seven horns suggest to you? What does a horn represent? Seven being all, complete, sovereign, power. This lamb has seven horns, and he has seven eyes, all-seeing, wisdom, all-knowing. So, that's right. Well done, John. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth? He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is a punctiliar event. This is where Jesus comes and takes that book. It can be located on a timeline somewhere. The question is where? I put it here for the following reasons. Notice what happens. Notice what the elders and what the angels all sing. They sing a new song. This means what you are about to hear has never been heard or said in heaven before. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because, A, you were slain. Okay? That at least puts it past Calvary. You were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, and well, look there, and 10,000 times 10,000, he's got the same problem Daniel had. How do you number such an august assembly? They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice, they sang this song. Watch this, the seven attributes that are given to Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb, who was slain to receive one, power, two, wealth, three, wisdom, four, strength, five, honor, six, glory, and seventh, praise. Everything there is to give, Jesus gets it. I believe that's when he was brought in before the Father and was led into his presence because he had been found worthy to receive authority, glory, and sovereign power. Daniel and John saw the same thing. Makes e and then, if you accept that, the explanation of the seals becomes very easy, the timing of them. One more thing that cinches it for me. Now, it may not for you, but it does for me. Let me show you one more thing. We only have just a few minutes. These subjects are so wonderful to examine and to look into, they just never end. It's really neat of the Lord to give me a subject to talk on, isn't it, that just never ends? <laughs> <laughs> on the Day of Atonement, let me take you back to the Old Testament for a moment in the sanctuary and uh, just remind you of an interesting thing. Here is the courtyard. Here is the little building, you know, the tabernacle. Here is the holy place, and here is the most holy place. On the Day of Atonement, before the high priest could officiate on behalf of Israel, he had to be found worthy. He brought a bull and put it on the altar, and then for his own sins, according to Leviticus 16, he goes in behind the veil and stands there before the ark and before God, and before he can officiate between the two goats, you know, the Lord's goat and the scapegoat, before he can take care of services, before he can conduct the cleansing of the sanctuary, 
He's got to be approved of God. If the bells, if the bells aren't ringing, who's going to go get him? <laughs> you know, he wore bells on the bottom of his garment. Some literature, Jewish literature said that the high priest wore a rope tied to his right foot. That's right. Underneath the veil, to enter into God's presence is a fearful thing. It, it, it's an awesome thing. It, his, his eminence, the Most High, the Almighty, the God of the universe, when he came down and just sat on Mount Sinai, the mountain could barely hold him up. It was quivering. On the Day of Atonement, before the cleansing could begin, the issue of worthiness was paramount. Not for the people, but for the high priest. This is an issue that is singularly related to the high priest. Well, you get the point already then. Who is our high priest? Jesus. When was he found worthy? When the time came, just before the time came, to begin cleaning the sanctuary. That's the way it was done in the Old Testament. The parallel, the pattern, is the same. The pattern is that here in 1798, the court convenes, Jesus is found worthy, and he starts the cleansing in 1844, and that happens to be what the third seal is all about, the rider on the horse bearing the scales. Judgment, justice, being weighed in the balances. So, to summarize, what have I said tonight? One, Daniel 7 puts the prom promotion, the exaltation, the sovereignty of Christ, the empowerment of Christ. It connects that with an event on earth so that we can know the date to be 1798. Make sense? The heaven-earth linkage. Number two, in Revelation 5, we find that Jesus, at an appointed time, receives all this power, a glory, an authority, and he's found worthy to take this book and to begin breaking open its seals because he is worthy to exonerate the charges, the false charges made against God from the beginning. And number three, the Old Testament sanctuary parallel teaches us that just before, on the very day that the cleansing when the time for cleansing comes, the high priest must be found worthy before he can do the cleansing. And so I conclude by saying the seals began opening in 1798. And in fact, if you accept that, then the seals are very easy to see what they mean. Let me summarize what they mean in a heartbeat here so that in case you didn't remember it from last night, here we go. The first seal is salvation, the salvation of God by faith or through faith. That's the rider on the white horse riding out to conquer. He doesn't conquer anything yet, but he will when he gets to the second coming because the rider on the white horse is Jesus and he has come to conquer and he wears the title king of kings and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he cuts down the nations. Here is the great sword of truth. This is the word of God. And with this sword, the truth, un, uh, the truth exposed the foolishness and the vanity of the doctrines that the church had corrupted all this past millennium. And so God sends the word throughout the earth. And people end up killing themselves, killing each other over what they believe to be the will and the word of God. This is, this is, these are the martyrs. Persecution is coming, and why is there persecution? Because there's going to be a, good, a big contest over what is truth and what is not. 
The third seal is 1844. This is the judgment of the dead, the first part of the cleansing of heaven's temple. And at the fourth seal, we go to the judgment, the judgment of the living. Here is where the judgments of God are poured out, sword, famine, plague, and wild beast, and 25% of the earth is destroyed. Then, at the end of the 1,000 years, the seventh and final seal is broken open, and Jesus shows the world and all that are alive what the Father knew before anything began and how he chose to solve the drama of sin. Now, are you ready to explain this to your friends? I'm still the face. <laughs> <laughs> Any question before we, before we quit tonight? Okay. You talk about parallels and patterns. You have the first horse going to a result. You have the second seal of the horse going to a result. You have the third seal of the horse going to a horse. No, the result. The fourth seal is a horse. The, the, well, the, there is a rider on the horse, and the reason that there are the four horsemen is because, well, I didn't cover that. Um, let me say it this way. The result of this rider named death is to be taken as a direct command. The authority of Jesus will be revealed by the work of this horseman, if you will. Well, since you have the other horses going out, and yeah. this horse isn't going out. Well, but it's not, the horse is only a vehicle. It's not the, I mean, it's not that people see the horse or, or notice the horse. This is about the revelation of Jesus. Here is the salvation of Jesus. Here is the word of Jesus. Here is the ministry of Jesus. Here is the authority of Jesus. Here's the faith of Jesus. Here's the physical revealing of Jesus. And here's the deity of Jesus. This is the revealing of all that Jesus is. I know I haven't answered every question. I can't. But I hope I've given you enough to go back and look at this. This is a profound topic, and it keys in very closely with coming events starting here. But if you understand this, how the stage has been set, hey, this will make a lot more sense then. Jesus has been working for the last 150 years setting the stage on earth for what he's about to do. That's exactly, and that's precisely what's been going on. When people ask me, what has Jesus been doing in heaven? I tell him, he's moving all of his players into their places because when he casts the censer down, 